I hope is um, this format is not typical for the way that I like to do workshops. I like high interaction. Um, you know, and so 90 minutes of talking to the screen is going to be a bit tricky. Mm -hmm. um, but this is part of the, the world that we're in. And the workshop is really about adapting and thriving in these uncertain times. And so um, we'll all have to adapt to this. I hope I keep it engaging enough. We'll do a couple polls. And there's a few activities where I'm going to ask people to write down some thoughts um, as we go through this. So I'm excited to be here with you um, today. You know, for me, it's morning. I'm in the United States. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about me um, as we go through this. But uh, so the topic for today is around resilience and this idea of, you know, as each of you as founders or leaders in an organization, um, how you're going to help yourselves and your organizations navigate through the uncertainty. And we keep hearing this term, the new normal. And mm -hmm. I, I like the idea that we're defining it as a new normal because we know that there is no going back. There's only going forward and forward is going to look different. Um, nobody knows what forward's going to look like, but uh, we're all going to figure it out together. And um, we're resilient as people and you know, across the globe. And so um, this is an exploration and hopefully a workshop that um, will help you reflect for yourselves and for your businesses on uh, what you need to do to adapt in these uncertain times. Absolutely. I just, before I completely hand over to you, I just um, saw, yeah, I want to say to all of you guys, you are automatic on mute. Um, make sure that when you want to comment, I said this a little earlier, but I see uh, Gregory also is mentioning it. Make sure that you comment to the attendees and panelists so that everyone can see your comments. And then all of you will see at the bottom of your screen, if you kind of like hover over like the main screen, you'll see a Q and A, and it would be great if you can post your questions in there, uh, then it's kind of like we know that the chat is going on one side and the Q and A on the other side. Also, as Brian will be going through his workshop, feel welcome to throw those questions in at any stage. You don't need to remember it for the Q and A afterwards. Yeah. Um, even if he doesn't answer it right at that stage, at least you know what you wanted to ask, and and we'll we'll get it it all at the end. Okay, yeah. Brian, handing. Perfect. All right, so I'm going to dive in. Um, so this, this slide um, and this quote, behold the turtle, he only makes progress when he sticks his neck out. Um, James Conan was a former president of Harvard University. And um, I love this quote and I love this image. This is a turtle actually nesting on the beach in Ostinelis, Costa Rica, um, a place that I travel to a few times a year for a leadership program that I run. Um, but it's this idea that we as people only make progress when we stick our necks out. And so right now, we've all been placed in a vulnerable position, not by choice, um, but because of COVID-19. And as a result, um, we're having to take risks and we're having to change our behavior. But progress is really only made when we're willing to push outside our comfort zone. And so as we go through um, this session, what I hope you think about is the changes that you're making, the ways that you're learning and growing um, through what can be a somewhat uncomfortable experience but hopefully one that yields good learnings and positive results in the long run. So a little bit about me. Um, I run two businesses. My core business, which I'm here representing today, is called Groove Management. It's a human capital consulting firm. So we do leadership development, organizational development, a lot of team building, and uh, executive coaching. And I spent 20 plus years working for a number of different companies um, both in the US, I worked for a Korean company at one point. Uh, I spent a decent amount of time working in um, Belgium and in Norway as well. Um, so I have had you know, good exposure um, to Europe. I'm originally from New York City. I now live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I got moved here um, for a job several years ago and um, it's uh, a nice place to live, a good climate. Um, it's spring here in a big way. Um, the temperature is actually gonna be 30 Celsius or so this weekend, so I'm uh, definitely feeling like summer. Um, I am married to a Norwegian and my daughter does live in Norway, so I definitely spend a decent amount of time um, in Norway. And uh, I'm on the board of a few different companies. So groove management, the reason that it's called groove management, I believe that everyone has a groove, something that makes them better, special, or different. And so I spend a lot of time working with executives, first time CEOs in particular, on establishing what is their groove for them as individuals and for their organizations as well. Um, you'll see here a list of some of the client organizations that we work with. 
Um, hopefully many of you will join the um, founder conversation this evening where I'm gonna interview um, Aman Narang, who is the co-founder of Toast, which is a restaurant point of sale software company in the US, um, valued at $4.9 billion. They've been a true unicorn that's really um, done well, but their business has been you know, adversely impacted by COVID as well. The other business I run is called Leader Surf, and uh, I'm an avid surfer, have been since I was a little kid, and I found a way to combine my passion um, with my profession. And so I bring executives from around the world to Costa Rica two to three times a year for an open enrollment leadership program. And part of that program is teaching executives how to surf. It's back to the turtle. I believe that we learn best when we push out of our comfort zone and try something new. And the older we get, the more we spend time doing the things we're already good at. And so learning to surf is a great metaphor for learning vulnerability, learning resilience. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the program. So our goal, what do we want to do over the course of the next, let's call it 80 minutes? Um, explore the importance of vulnerability to learning, back to the turtle, and um, discuss tactics for how are we going to adapt to the challenges that we're facing. Um, and then this topic of resilience. What is resilience? Where does it come from? Um, you know, who are the most resilient people we know and what makes them resilient? Um, and how do we deal with adversity? So I've given you a bit of an intro, an overview, um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about what's changed in our world, right? And so one of the big things that I keep hearing is around the uncertainty and how that creates anxiety and concern. And so part of it is this idea of what's certain versus what's certain, what's within our control versus what's outside of our control. We'll talk about the topic of resilience, give a definition, and really start to probe what is resilience all about. Talk about you as leaders and um, what it means to lead through a crisis. Talk about the, the characteristics that make certain people more resilient than others. And introduce you to a model called the Resilience Factor Inventory. Um, there's an actual assessment that if you're interested in learning more, I can share about. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of this idea of visioning and you know, um, having this idea in your mind that's the power of I will, you know, and what you're willing and able to do in terms of making changes um, and commitments. And then we'll wrap up. So I want you to take a second and look at this image and think about the first couple words that come to mind um, when you see this image. Get a word or two in your head. Typically when I do this in a workshop and I do it live and then I ask each person to share um, their words. You know, the words that are typically come to mind are inefficient, I see an ineffective, I see hard. Um, you know, in terms of people in the chats sharing words already, most of the words have negative connotations. And I always like to say that if I open the dictionary to the word opportunity, this would be an amazing picture to have next to the word opportunity. Because everything that these people need to be successful is right there. But they're so busy doing the work that they don't take a step back to think about, is there a more efficient or a better way to do this, right? And it's because the square wheels, they work. They actually do work. They go thump, 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 you know, when you're making progress. But if they took a time out and took the time to reconfigure this, they have the round wheels and tires in the cart. Um, they would be able to make much more progress in the long run, but in the short run, they'd feel like they were impeding their progress. And so the way I like to look at what we're going to discuss today is this idea of taking a time out and reflecting on the situation taking stock of what you have and what resources you can deploy is an important thing for founders to do right now with your businesses. Because your businesses are being impeded, your progress has been slowed down, but you may have resources that you hadn't thought about a different or a new way to use. And that's part of resilience is this idea of being able to adapt. So the square wheels image, you know, it really to me is about opportunity. So I'm gonna ask um, Serena to actually launch a poll and I'm gonna ask each of you to select from this list of words and tell us how you are feeling today. So it's which of the words best describes how you're currently feeling. And you can only choose one word. So from this list, yeah, one word, it's anonymous. We won't know who said what, but we'll see kind of trend wise um, 
what you guys choose. So one word to describe how you're currently feeling today. Open for like a 90% response rate. And then once we uh, get the responses, Serena will publish it so we can all see how, how people are feeling. Right, we're on 70% responses. All right, a few more people. Tell us how you feel. Um, I must say, so far, okay, 70% completed, but looking good actually. 75. This is one of four polls, so we're gonna we're, we're gonna keep at this throughout um, the session. And try to keep you engaged, involved, and in, uh, you know, getting everyone to see a little bit of how the rest of the people on this call are faring. Okay, so we're kind of like on seventy-five percent. Can I? All right, let's let's publish. Let's see. Let's see how this worked out and what people are saying. All right, so if you look at the results, you can see that optimistic with 30% of the respondents um, came out first. And I think, you know, in the chat we saw as we were getting ready for the call, the idea that it seems like restaurants and businesses are starting to open back up, um, yeah, that's a very positive sign. And so optimistic is definitely a good way to feel. And what's most important about this is as a group of people that are responsible for leading others, um, your sentiment and the way you feel and the way you position yourself has a very big impact on the rest of the people around you. Um, you know, I've done this workshop and done this poll several times and it's been interesting because uh, anxiety tends to be the one that I've seen the most. Um, so now the difference is I'm dealing with a bunch of founders and entrepreneurs on this call and one of the traits that I find for entrepreneurs be successful is that they have to be glass half full. They have to be optimistic people in order to um, take the risk involved in starting a business. Those working for larger businesses um, that are more risk averse, they tend to be the ones that are more anxious. So this doesn't surprise me, but it's great to see that sentiment amongst the people on the call today. So a little bit about resilience, right? So let's start with just kind of a textbook definition. Resilience is the capacity to adapt from negative change and recover from it as quickly as possible, right? It's this idea of bouncing back. Everyone needs resilience. It's a fundamental element of being happy um, in our lives and in this world, right? It's a coping mechanism. And so where does it come from? Well, it starts with our beliefs, our thoughts, those feelings that we have, and then how we turn that into action and then drive results. And remember, it's about the speed at which we're able to recover from negative change, right? And so we've got to digest the change, we've got to deal with it, and then we have to commit to action. And so that's one of the things that we're going to talk about as we go through this is, what are the actions that you're taking in order to commit and to make changes um, for the positive, to recover from you know, the impact that coronavirus is having on our businesses, on our society, on our families, and everyone around us. So I'm going to ask another polling question, and this was this one is something you did before the stay-at-home order that you're still doing. So before you were asked to shut down, work from home, you know, and kind of stay in place, quarantine. Um, and this one, you can choose multiple things. What are some of the things that you used to do that you're still doing today? These are routines potentially: making your bed daily, hygiene, working out walking your dog, cooking meals at home, checking social media. My guess is that most of you are doing many of these things still and that you did them. So let's see um, how we come out on this poll. I think our benchmark, Serena, is 75%. <laughs> yeah, actually at the end we had 83. Okay. Right now we're on 78. They say every vote counts. Yeah. Great stuff, 86. 
All right, let's let, let's publish it and see. All right, it's good. People are uh, still brushing their teeth and taking showers. 81% <laughs> are still practicing daily hygiene, making their bed, working out in fitness, cooking meals at home, right? Um, enjoying happy hour, 19%. Walking your dog, 10%. Well, not everyone has a dog. So um, this all makes sense. The purpose behind this is this idea that when we can commit things to habit and continue to do them, it brings certainty to the uncertainty in the world, right? And so here's just some examples of that. The idea of creating routines, establishing a cadence, and doing things that you've always done are one of the ways that when we're dealing with uncertainty, if there's certain things that you can continue to do that you've been doing, it takes some of the ambiguity and some of the concern out of, out of our day. Um, I have a coaching client, he's the CEO of a company, he was a former military guy, he used to be on um, nuclear subs, and uh, he is very reg regimented. There's a great video um, on the internet from this U.S. general about why it's important to make your bed every morning, and tells the fact that um, in the military they have everyone make their bed every morning, and part of it is because they call it task accomplishment. If you can start your day off by accomplishing a task, you can build momentum to, to accomplish other tasks. So this coaching client of mine, this CEO, was telling me that he was having a really difficult time with making the transition to working from home. And as we probed deeper, he said, you know, I get up every morning at the same time I always did. I make my breakfast and so forth. But then I go to my office and I have trouble getting started going to work. I said to him, well, how's that different than when you work in your office? He said, well, my commute was only 10 minutes, but that time in the car was super valuable to me. I used that time to make a list of what I needed to do that day and get in the right frame of mind. So I asked him the question, I said, well, what's stopping you from getting in your car and going for a drive for 10 minutes and then driving back into your driveway and going into your home office? And so for the past six or seven weeks, he's been doing his daily commute and his feedback to me was, it works just as well as driving to the office. He said, such a simple thing, but it made a huge difference. So my point to you is figure out a way to duplicate the things that brought you efficiency and peace before and you know, find a way to create routines in your life, even during this uncertain time. And as we create the new normal, um, you know, it may be even more important to establish new routines. All right, so this is a, an important one and a big point of reflection in, in, in this workshop. What I'd like you to do is to think about the largest obstacle that you've ever overcome. What was it? Was it you know, the loss of a job? Was it um, you know, a health issue that you dealt with? Was it the loss of a loved one? Um, what is the largest obstacle that you've ever overcome in your life? I want you to kind of get something in your head. And I do see a question Sylvia, I will address your question in two slides, if you don't mind. All right, so come up with an obstacle, biggest thing that you've had to deal with in your life. And this follow-up question to me is the more important question. Was the obstacle self-imposed, meaning I placed it there, or did it come from an outside source? My guess, and in doing this with lots of groups, is that more often than not, like 80% of the time, the biggest obstacles we face in our life are not self-imposed. Nobody asked for coronavirus, right? Nobody asked to lose their job. Nobody asked to you know, get sick with cancer or to you know, have a loved one die suddenly. Um, these are all things that you know, come from the outside. And so when you think about really where our biggest points of resilience and growth come from, they come from being pushed out of our comfort zone. They come from necessity, not from choice. And so I just want you to be thinking about that as you look at where real growth comes from. Once again, I, I mentioned this fact that we tend to spend way too much of our time in our comfort zone doing things that we're comfortable doing, but the real growth and learning happens when we are forced, like the turtle, to stick our neck out. So let me address Sylvia's question just quickly in terms of how can I support my team in 
um, thinking their, you know, in, in their daily routine. I think two things that come to mind. One is to make certain that you have a cadence within your business in terms of not just ad hoc meetings, but having your set schedule. One are your one-on-ones, one are your weekly meetings, one are your, if it's a daily meeting, have them all at the same time and set a calendar so there is some consistency to that. And then on a call with your team, I would ask as kind of an icebreaker to ask your team for each of them to share what their daily routine is. You know, I always tell the story that when I first left the corporate world and uh, started working for myself and started my own business um, and working from home before I went and got an office, um, one of the things that I found was that when I worked for a company, I like to work out and I like to run. And so I'd get up in the mornings and I'd go for a run you know, before light at like 5.36 in the morning before work. That was hard for me. It wasn't the best time for me to go running. And so when I started working from home, what I found was that I could go for a run at like 10.30 or 11 in the morning. And I ran better. I was, you know, I had eaten breakfast. I was feeling better. The run was better for me. Um, but my wife had made a comment like, I don't want you out running at 10.30 in the morning because all the housewives in the neighborhood will think that you're unemployed. And I kind of laughed at that and said, you know what? I don't care what they think. You know, I have a full-time job. I'm doing quite well. I'm not going to worry about what others think. I'm going to create a routine that works for me. And so running in the middle of the morning works for me. And so part of it with your team is to ask them what works for them and to be able to let them have the liberty to create a routine that works for them as long as it's not distracting to the business. But I would ask each of them to share with each other what is kind of a, you know, a routine hack, something that they're doing that just works for them. So when it comes to those obstacles that I mentioned and the biggest ones that you overcame, more than anything, it starts with having the belief in yourself and this ability to say, I can do it, right? I didn't ask for this to happen to me, but rather than playing the victim, you play the savior and you say, I can do it. And having that mental fortitude to overcome is really where, yeah, where resilience starts. It starts in our mind. We'll discuss that a little bit further. So I want to ask another polling question. This was really about positive vibes, positivity. One positive thing that you experienced or started doing since the pandemic started. Something that you hadn't been doing before, but now you're doing so. Here's the poll from Serena. Choose one, just one, one thing that you've experienced or started doing that you hadn't been doing before. You get over 75%. Yeah, we're actually on 84, but I see. Awesome. Um, cool, we're on 88, here we go. You guys are good, I appreciate the uh, interaction. All right, so the positive things, the top two, it looks like are spending more time with family and cooking meals, right? So I think that's really important is that when, when you reflect on this, you know, not all bad things have come from the situation we're in. Um, you know, there's many good things that have come from it and it's important to take the time to take stock and recognize that, hey, spending more time with family, having those meals, you know, figuring out what do we have in the pantry that we can mix together to make something. Um, you know, there's camaraderie and there's things that we've just been moving so quickly you know, life has sped up so much that this has been a nice pause in many respects. Um, you know, the hope is that things will return to a new normal, but in the meantime, um, there are definitely some positives. And this idea of focusing in on the things that, you know, that have made, given you peace or made you feel good during this time is very important. So I'm going to show a video um, in a minute, and you know it's kind of a feel-good story. And you know, just to start off with, this is Koh Phangan, Thailand. 
Um, this is a fishing village in Thailand. And uh, this is the story of um, a group of kids that lived on this island. Um, and so let me switch to the video and um, we'll be back in a few minutes. ถ้าพูดถึงทีมฟุตบอลของเราคงต้องย้อนกลับไปที่วันแรกที่นี่ชาวบ้านชอบดูฟุตบอลกันมากแต่ไม่มีใครเล่นเลยหรอกอย่างที่เห็นเราคิดว่าอยู่บนน้ำนัดเล่นเล่นได้แล้วคนที่นี่มีผู้หญิงสักนิดกินอะไรกันเยอะที่เล่นกันได้คือเรือไม่ไม่กระมอกแล้วความจับได้นั่นแหละความคิดเล็กๆก็เกิดขึ้นพวกเราเ
All right. Well, apparently we had a little bit of technical difficulty, but it's a pretty cool story, right? Um, so us crazy Americans call that um, soccer, but uh, the rest of the world football, right? Um, just this idea of resilience in action, how the Kopenyi, these youth, you know, they weren't constrained by their environment. They chose to build this pitch on the water with nails and so forth. But what they realized was that they actually had some skills that others didn't. And so their superpower here was their ball handling skills, their ability to have touch and feel and play barefoot on the confined field, which gave them strength that the other team didn't have, especially when it started raining. And so, you know, the other piece that comes to mind about this story is the leadership piece. And as you saw, this was a group of people that were not leader led to begin with. They were led themselves, right? But they believed in themselves and that belief and trust in each other led them to their success, right? The elder in the village initially had been laughing at them, but maybe that was his way of challenging them to see how committed they were to their cause. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you know, as a leader, he was a cheerleader. And so sometimes, you know, if you think about your own leadership roles in your organization, it's better to lead from the back than the front and to be a servant leader and to empower your team to do the things that they want to do and ask the right questions rather than give the right answers. So I love the story. I uh, see that um, it was shared as a, a link in terms of the YouTube video, if you want to see the high quality version of it. I'm um, sorry that it didn't play so smoothly, uh, but it is a really encouraging story. I use this a lot um, in team building workshops um, to really talk about a shared mission statement you know, and a commitment to one another and the great things that these kids accomplished together. So. So when you think about resilience, I like to think of it as being like a muscle that gets strengthened through adversity, right? And that we build what I call muscle memory. Right? There are certain muscles that if you don't use them over time, they atrophy. But in the case of resilience, it's kind of like learning to ride a bike. If you learn to ride a bike once and then you don't ride a bike for 20 years and you get back on a bike, you have the muscle memory to ride it again. You don't have to relearn. And so what I find is that resilience is like a muscle. It does get strengthened with the more adversity we've been through. And the more we've been through, the more adept we are at dealing with future adversity. So the idea of going through this pandemic that we're going through now and being resilient and coming out stronger and better on the other end means the next time that we as individuals, as organizations, or as a society are faced with another threat we will be better suited and better capable to deal with the adversity that's thrown in front of us because we've built that muscle memory. But if you think about kind of the path to resilience, it typically begins with resistance. Resistance is the normal response that we have when something in the environment or in an organization changes and we view it as a threat, right? We push back on it. We see it as, um, threatening, not what we want. And so this whole idea of a change model, right, when you can be actively involved in a change decision, you're much more likely to embrace change. But when change is forced upon you, the first thing you do is push back and resist. And so as you see, you know, with kind of the coronavirus, the initial reaction around the world was to resist, was to say, we don't need to lock ourselves up. We don't need to quarantine. We don't need to stay home. Uh, this is something that's just happening in China until it moved across the world, right? And so now we've recognized that resistance isn't the right path, that we actually need to adapt. And so once you go through that stage of resisting change, the most important the thing I think that makes the human species so special is that we are adaptable. We either adapt ourselves or we've found ways to adapt the world around us, right? I, worked for um, Ingersoll Rand, a big multinational conglomerate that owns train air conditioners. And if you think about the advent of the air conditioner, the air conditioner changed our world in a big way in terms of where and how we can live because we we're able to adapt the environment to us rather than adapting ourselves to the environment. And so we have, as a human species, 
been really good at either adapting ourselves or changing our circumstances around us. But that requires that we first recognize where our resistance is, have an impetus or a reason for change. And so you know, this change of behavior that we've done and how it's flattened the curve has been really important. And so at the same time for each of you as founders and when you think about your company, the question is, what have you done to adapt your company to the new normal? Besides for just sending your people to work from home, have you seen hidden opportunities that you can exploit for your organization? When we have the founders interview in a couple hours, Aman will talk specifically about how Toast, their point of sale software solution, has become a huge advantage to several restaurants um, as they've moved to a takeout only format and how they were able to pivot quickly and adapt their business. Another foundation of resilience is this capacity to adapt from negative change and adversity, right? And so um, I think Instagram has done us all a disservice because you see these images of people that look all too perfect and so forth and this path to success being a straight line. The path to success is rarely a straight line. It's usually a lot of fits and starts and as startups and founders, you probably are very aware that in many instances, the company you set out to create is not the company you ended up creating. Um, you either saw that you had to um, shift course because of the market conditions or shift course because the opportunity was a little bit different. But the resilient people are the ones that adapt and recover quickly and that they can pivot. And so what's being challenged for us all now is to pivot, to adapt, and to find new ways of doing the work that we used to do. So I'm gonna ask each of you another question and then we're gonna do the poll. But before we do the poll, what I'd like you to do is think about the most resilient person you know, personally. Um, you know, let's not choose a favorite person, let's choose somebody um, that you know, somebody in your life, somebody that was in your life, uh, a friend of yours, you know, a coworker, a spouse, somebody that you think of as the most resilient person. Think about who they are, what makes them resilient, what adversity did they face, and my guess is that they're resilient because they overcame at least one adversity, um, but they've overcome it at this point. And then I'm going to ask Serena to um, post the next poll. And so the question here is, which of the following, and you can choose multiple, resilience characteristics did your person display? So these are some of the characteristics of resilient people, and you can choose as many as the person that you're thinking about has displayed. How are we doing, Serena? We're on 60, 70%, uh, 75, Great. 18. Okay, well, I appreciate the continued engagement. This is our way or my way of testing that people are still, still with us. All right, number one, determination, right? This ability to, it's back to the little kid meme with the I can do it, right? That self-belief and determination, ability to maintain focus is another one, positivity, optimism, right? So when you look at this list, there are certain things that really ring true and that become consistent in those people that um, are able to display resiliency, right? They're able to do this. To me, one of the most important ones that didn't rate that high on here though, was a willingness to ask for help from others right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to go at things alone. And being able to reach out and get help from others is really important. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, but that was a nice list and I appreciate you guys thinking about that. And so as you think about your own resilience, think about those people and some of those things, that determination, that optimism, the positivity you know, that they brought to their challenge um, and how you can bring that to the challenges that you face and how that can then become contagious with the people that you um, interact with within your organizations. 
So as an example for me, um, this is a guy that I used to work with. His name is Charles Hunt. Um, he did an amazing TED talk um, called What Trauma Taught Me About Resilience. And uh, you can view that on um, YouTube. And then I have actually a podcast on my website on groovemanagement.com where I interviewed Charles. He and I started doing resilience workshops not long after this together for corporate groups. Um, but what was interesting is Charles and I worked together at Ingersoll Rand. He was a corporate recruiter. He did university recruiting. I didn't know him all that well, um, but one of the people that had worked with him ended up moving over and working for my team. And she didn't have great things to say about Charles as a boss. Um, and I didn't think that highly of him because of what I had heard from his employee and so forth. But then all of a sudden I'm in the audience at this TEDx event and here he is up on stage and he nailed it. He was unbelievable. Um, standing ovation from everyone. He did this amazing talk. And what I didn't realize was that he grew up with a father who was in prison, a mother who was addicted to crack. Um, he was raised by his grandmother. You know, he'd seen a lot of violence and drugs and so forth. He was raised in the projects in Los Angeles. Uh, he was the first person to go to college from uh, his family. He got a job in Intel Corporation and did really well there. He owns a home. He's done all these things, but he'd gone through such trauma in his life that to come out on the other end, and then Ingersoll Rand fired him, not surprisingly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from the feedback that he'd gotten, and what it turns out is that corporate recruiting wasn't his thing. He had kind of followed the money versus following what his passion was for. And now he runs a company called the Audacity Firm, and they do resilience training, and he does motivational speaking, and he's found his place in the world, and he's doing extremely well. When he and I reconnected, you know, we talked about the fact that he was not in the right job and wasn't happy where he was, but he's got this innate ability to bounce back, and he's finally found his true path. And so you know, I see him as a friend and as an inspiration in terms of his story of resilience and finding his path. So on to you guys, you know, in leading your organizations. I like to think of any company as like an organism. It's a living, breathing thing that's influenced by the people in the environment, right? And so, you know, you think about growing things in a little Petri dish, you grow culture in a Petri dish, right? And that's how, um, you know, scientists come up with cures and so forth. So a culture can either be negatively contagious or positively contagious. And so for each of you being very clear on the type of culture that you want in your company, what your core values are, Aman will talk about specifically the core values at Toast and how they've driven the company and how they help them through having to go through a significant round of layoffs, but do it in a toasty way, as they call it, um, with compassion and empathy. And so having this clarity about your organization and what you stand for is really important and especially when you're dealing with the adversity that this situation has created. I believe strongly that an organization is only as resilient as the people who run it. So that means that you, the people on this call, if you're resilient and you model that optimism, determination, and those factors that you all pointed to already, if you model that for your teams, you will then build resilient organizations that will be able to withstand the challenges. But if you model weakness, then that will be pers will persevere and your organization may not survive. And so it's really important to think about, yes, you can show your vulnerability, but at the same time, being very clear on your confidence and your determination in getting through this as an organization is what your people need to hear from you on a daily basis. A leader must model resilience and vulnerability. And these two things seem like at times that they may go you know, in opposite directions because vulnerability is the willingness to show you know, potential weaknesses. But at the same time, that makes you more human and more approachable because nobody's perfect. And by showing that and asking for help, it actually feeds into your resilience. So resilience starts in our mind, right? We have to believe I can and then I will and then I do. And so this idea of, you know, mind first. If you think about it, 
And this is really kind of why my business is called Groove Management. I believe we all have a groove, something that makes us better, special, or different. It starts with self-awareness. It starts with being able to know yourself better than anyone else. You know, people say that some people are more wise than others. I believe being wise really just means being self-aware. means knowing your strengths and knowing your weaknesses. So let me define it for you. So awareness is knowing what's happening around you. Self-awareness is knowing how you're experiencing it. It's the ability to know what we're doing as we're doing it and understand why we're doing it. So this picture of me in a car looking in the side view or rear view mirror, because I believe that in order to look forward, we have to be able to look back. We are a compilation of all the experiences, good and bad, that we've had in our life. And so our self-awareness comes from how we dealt with different situations. And in order to do that, we have to look back at the different experiences, the challenges that we faced and the successes that we've had. So in order to make this simple for people, I use this Superman analogy. And I say Superman is the most powerful superhero um, because he has hidden superpowers, right? There's certain powers we know. We all know that he's able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. We know that he's faster than a speeding bullet. We know that he's more powerful than a locomotive. And he has x-ray vision. We also know that kryptonite is his one weakness. You see Superman's hidden superpowers that he's fully aware of his strengths and his weakness. And this is the challenge is that I don't believe there's another superhero in comic book lore or anywhere else where we know what their weakness is. But Superman has chosen to share his weakness with the world he believes in the power and the goodness of others, that by sharing his weakness, more people will protect him from it than use it against him. In my 25 years of doing work with different leaders, I found that self-awareness is the one thing that separates great leaders from all others, right? You can talk about, oh, being optimistic or being charismatic or being a great public speaker or being an innovator. I, don't, I think leaders come in all sizes and shapes. The one thing that differentiates the best from all others is they know themselves really well and they've figured out a way to play to their strengths and compensate for their weaknesses. So once again, it's a differentiator between great leaders and everyone else. So I want you to take a minute and take stock and just write down, if someone were to say, what are your three superpowers? Right? What are your Superman superpowers? What are three things that you do better, special, or different than anyone else? This is just for you. We're not doing any sharing, but something to give some thought to. And you don't have to do it now. You can hold it for later um, you know, or write them down quickly because uh, I want to keep us moving. The corollary to that is to define your kryptonite. So if you have three superpowers, what is your one kryptonite? What is the one thing that you do that gets you into trouble? What's your weakness? And then I asked also, how many people have you told about it and why not tell more people? Because sharing that weakness, I think actually you know, will serve you better than keeping it to yourself and keeping it hidden. Acknowledging and sharing your weakness with others is actually a sign of strength. Right? It's back to this idea of vulnerability. It gives people a sense that you're human and it makes you more likable. So my quote here um, you know, is that I believe that each of us should be the leader we're meant to be. When we try to emulate others and be like them, we reject the power that you have to be the best leader you can be. And that if leadership is about individuality, then there's only one you on this planet, and so you should be you. You, know, you can read all the books about you know, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and all these other people that people think are such amazing leaders, Elon Musk, but emulating them isn't gonna make you a better leader. It's gonna make you someone else. It's not gonna make you yourself. And so you've gotta figure out who you are. Serena, I think you, know, you asked the question, should people share um, here? Uh, if they want to, they can. I think, you know, it, this may be more for self-reflection. So some additional characteristics. We talked about self-awareness. We talked about it starting in your brain. In terms of resilient people view obstacles as challenges. They don't see them as unsurmountable. They see them as things to either go over, through, or around. 
All right, I have to add my surfing you know, analogy in here. Um, I believe that we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. And that's one of the reasons that I love teaching people how to surf, because even the best surfers in the world wipe out every time they go in the ocean. This is a picture um, of a Suana Gordon. She is the um, creative director for FCB, a global advertising agency in Johannesburg, South Africa. She runs Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola account for South Africa for them. And she came to the program and had never surfed before. And one of the first things that they teach, the professional surf instructors teach in the first lesson is how to fall, right? In business, we don't teach people how to fail because we don't want them to fail. But in surfing, we teach people how to fail because we know it's inevitable and there's a right and a wrong way. You're supposed to fall like a starfish. And this is a flawless fail because she's falling the exact right way. Because if you fall head first, you can hit your head on the bottom and hurt yourself. If you fall foot first, you can sprain or break an ankle. But if you fall like a starfish, you limit the depth of your fall. And so Suana is doing a flawless fail here. But the idea of being a resilient person is that we know we're gonna make mistakes, we know we're gonna fail, but we're gonna learn from those failures. Brene Brown has gained a lot of, you know, um, accolades for her approach and this idea of being vulnerable, being the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. It says, I'm perfect and I'm enough, right? Um, number of videos that you can watch with her and a couple of books that she's written as well. Um, her work has really mm -hmm. you know, kind of taken off. Having focus is super important, right? So the squirrels don't have focus. They bounce all over the place, but the idea of being able to be in fo in focus is really important for resilient people. They take the distractions out of the equation. We talked about adaptability and uh, this idea of being able to transform from a caterpillar to a butterfly, right? And that period of time in between is a sticky, gooey mess. And so it's not always pretty, but it's important. Another is we talk a lot about being smart and about IQ, but EQ is equally important for resilient people, right? It's this balancing of the heart and the head and where those decisions come from. And are you guided by your thinking or your feeling and having them in balance? Last is that you know, going it alone doesn't make sense. And I think this is one of the hardest things about you know, the coronavirus pandemic is that We've been forced into somewhat isolation and resilient people, they rely on each other. They use their social bonds to help navigate. And so, you know, in terms of being able to go through this together, one of the things that I tell leaders to do all the time with their teams now is don't start your meeting by just jumping straight to business because you don't have lunch together. You're not having the social interactions that you used to have. And so those social bonds start to dissipate a little bit. It's important to spend time with your teams and with your people talking about how everyone's feeling. It could be a one word intro for the meeting where each person shares how they're feeling that day. Whether I'm feeling optimistic, whether I'm feeling anxious, whether I'm sad. Owning those feelings, sharing them and being a support to one another is an important part of this. And so if you're gonna build resilience in your teams, it starts with, being willing to share and to ask, ask the question about how people are feeling. So I'm gonna introduce this resilience factor inventory. So this is a tool that um, I've been using and it's a model. And the model is that there's seven factors to resilience. Um, a colleague of mine actually had come up with this, uh, somebody that I've done some work with, uh, runs a company called Adaptive, and then came up with an assessment and then ultimately sold it to Corn Ferry. Um, and so now the workbook and the assessment is hosted by Corn Ferry, my organization, Groove Management. Um, we saw this, we talked about whether or not to have each of you complete the assessment in advance of the workshop, decided to hold off. But if it is something you're interested in, you can reach out to me afterwards, something that we could do with your organizations. Um, but the idea is that it's a way to measure the resilience of individuals by having them answer 60 questions in a quantifiable way um, to understand behavior patterns. So what I'm gonna do is introduce you to the seven factors of resilience. We're gonna kind of walk through these. 
um, over the next you know, 20 minutes or so. And then there's a few last pieces before we wrap up. So these are what the seven factors are, and I'm gonna dive into each one of them and explain kind of what they mean. So emotional regulation, right? It's this ability to stay calm under pressure. Do you wear your emotions on your sleeve, right? If you are not a good poker player and you can't hide your emotions, um, then you know, they're right out there for everyone to see. As a leader and a leader of other people, it's important to know when to keep your emotions in check and when to let them out, right? And so it's important that you model the right behaviors for your team and regulate the ones that are not gonna be helpful. You have to think about kind of the feelings and the actions that are tied to them. Do you keep them inside when it's important and do you let them out when it's also important? You know, which is the emoji that you, know, you would want best representing you? Um, you know, what does it look like on the inside and what does it look like on the outside to those around you? And can you be you know, deliberate in which emotions you're showing to others? The best way to improve in a, this really is this idea of, it's called cognitive thinking or cognitive therapy. Consciously thinking through in your mind and putting positive thoughts in there. If you begin with a positive thought, it can manifest itself and become self-fulfilling. If you allow negative thinking into your brain, mm -hmm. it becomes pervasive and it can take over. And so you need to become more aware of what you're thinking and how it's impacting your behavior. And make a conscious effort to plant positive seeds in your brain. And that's why back to kind of the general and starting with making your bed every day, the positive of task accomplishment starts kind of that momentum towards more positive. So think about whether you are regulating your emotions as it relates to how you're interacting with your family, your friends, your coworkers, those that work for you, your customers. Next one is around impulse control, right? It's the ability to shut out distractions, distractions, keep our behavior and our actions under control, right? And then my best way of thinking about this is resisting this urge to go into some of these thinking traps of overthinking things or thinking negative about it. Happens a lot in business where somebody will send you an email that um, has a negative tone to it, or you think it has a negative tone to it. And your first inkling is to bang on the keyboard and write like a nasty response to the person. If you have good impulse control, what you do is you may bang out that response, but then you save it in your drafts folder. You leave it there for an hour. You take a walk, you get involved in something else. And then an hour later, you open the email in your drafts and you read it as if you were the receiver. And then you diagnose, does this send the message that I'd want that person to get? Is that the response that I'd want back from them? And if you still feel the need to send it, then you send it. But those that don't exercise impulse control, bang out that email and send it immediately. And so it's this idea of being able to slow down, right? Call a personal timeout, make time your friend, digest the situation before reacting. And it's the same in terms of dealing with resilience and for your team to be thinking about as you go through navigating the uncertainty ahead, can you, not make rash decisions, but make calculated decisions. And you know, play out what are the scenarios that are gonna give us the best outcome. And that gets to this one, which is really around causal analysis. Can you really get to root cause? Can you do a good job of understanding, you know, if I take this course of action, what will happen? What are the upsides and downsides? If I take a different course, what are the upsides and downsides? So this idea of doing pros and cons, instead of playing victim and saying, well, it was me and so forth, you know, why do bad things always happen to me? Maybe you can understand you know, why these things are happening to you, you know, and are they externally caused or are they self-imposed? You've got to break these thinking habits um, and offer more flexibility. Uh, this is from kind of funny movie, um, Office Space, but this idea of jumping to conclusions, how do you improve your causal analysis? You learn to solve problems effectively by getting to that root cause. You don't have to do this alone. The idea of going through this with your team and helping them to understand you know, what are all the things that have 
led up to the situation you're currently in if you're in a crisis and what are the things that you can actually control versus those that are out of your control. Self-efficacy, our sense of capability and confidence in the world, our belief that we can solve the problems we experience and our ability to then succeed, right? It's this back to self-belief and you know, you guys as entrepreneurs, having that optimism and positivity is super important. Well, the Yoda quote, do or do not, there is no try, right? The confidence has to start with ourselves. If we don't believe in ourselves, it's almost impossible to get others to believe in us. And I find that this is the most true thing about entrepreneurs is that they have this belief in themselves and as a result, they can convince others to invest in them. Um, having worked with a lot of venture capital firms, what I find is that they less often invest in the idea than they invest in the people. And the question is, do I believe that this person is credible and that this person is going to be able to execute what they've set out to do or not? And that's why if you believe in yourself, you paint a picture and give others confidence in you. A winning streak starts with the first win, right? And so it's this idea about baby steps and what you can do to build this self-efficacy. To me, this is one of the most important ones when it comes to overall resilience, and it's this idea about realistic optimism. What's interesting is that there have been a number of studies and even the work with the Resilience Factor Inventory on this one. Realistic optimism actually is one that is not rated well for um, people in their 20s. And what they find is that it is somewhat age dependent because people that are younger tend to have greater optimism, but less realism. And it's this idea that they see the world through rose color lenses and those that have lived longer tend to have seen you know, more challenges in their world. And so having realistic optimism is having this balance between being realistic, but also being optimistic. Love this quote about the sailor, right? The pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change, the realist adjusts the sails. It's this idea about figuring out what are the things that I can control versus those things outside of my control. It goes back to creating those routines. Now, and when you create them, you kind of like this at little engine that could children's book, start with I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, until you get to I know I can because it becomes self-fulfilling. You got to start with having optimism, but it has to be realistic. On the right here is a picture of a SpaceX rocket making a successful launch. Yeah, this is Elon Musk's you know, company, SpaceX. You know, and it's the idea that you, know, you have to believe that you can persevere. Um, the Thomas Edison quote talks about he hasn't failed 700 times, he hasn't even failed once, he just succeeded in finding 700 ways not to make a light bulb. And so it's that idea of there is always gonna be learning through failure. Um, I love this concept of thinking about it as experiments that never fail, because if you have an experiment, it will either succeed and you'll learn something through the success, or it will not succeed, null hypothesis, and you'll have learnings as to how not to do it going forward. This one's super important, right? And it's this idea about having empathy. Um, you know, Forbes said it's the force that moves businesses forward. It's super important at this time, especially as companies are going through having to furlough and lay off and let people go. It's the not what you do, but it's the how you do it. It's the ability to really you know, see things through another person's perspective, walk a mile in their shoes. Daniel Pink, author, says that empathy is about standing in someone else's shoes, feeling with his or her heart, or seeing with his or her eyes. Not only is it hard to outsource and automate, but it makes the world a better place. If you think about it in this world of AI and machine learning, empathy is one thing that computers aren't going to replace. And so you know, those businesses that seem to be, especially in hospitality, that seem to be doing well or surviving now are the ones that actually are offering their services with empathy, and they're making stronger connections with their customers. The story, I use it in a diversity and inclusion training, but it also fits here. And it's this idea of there's this you know, fictitious tribe in Africa where everybody is born um, 
you know, with two arms, two legs, a nose, a mouth, and a pair of yellow sunglasses. And this youth in the village says to his elder, I want to go walk about and I want to go see the world. And so, you know, reluctantly, the father agrees and lets him leave. And so he goes out and walks in the world and he comes across another tribe. And he goes and lives with them. And this other tribe was born with two arms, two legs, a nose and a mouth, and a pair of blue sunglasses. And so as he got there, they gave him the pair of blue sunglasses. And he lived there for a year and experienced their ways and so forth. And then ultimately he went home. And when he went home, his father asked him about his experience. And he said, well, it was great to meet them and to understand their rituals and so forth. But it was really weird because the whole world was green. And the whole point of the story is that we have a lens through which we see the world. We're, it's shaped by our experiences and we can only superimpose the lens of others on top of our lens. We cannot remove our lens and truly see the world as others see it. We can only see it through our own bias plus their, their view. And so to have empathy, to tell somebody, oh, I understand what you're feeling. The truth is you can't fully understand what someone's feeling, but you can understand what you're feeling through the lens of what they say they're feeling. And I think it's important as you display empathy to recognize that and to recognize that you bring your own bias to the equation, but that it is important to you know, try to understand the feelings of others. The last one is around reaching out. And it's this ability to seek out challenges, push outside of our comfort zone, push the envelope, you know, and to ask for help. Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. It's this idea of challenge by choice. I use this model down on the bottom here um, all the time, and it's one of the things that we kick off the LeaderServe program with. And it's this idea about there's two types of stress in the world. We think about stress as being debilitating and being bad, but stress creates adrenaline and causes us to interact and react in a heightened way. To me, that positive stress is called eustress. And that's where the learning zone happens. When we push out of the comfort zone, when we're like the turtle and we stick our neck out. If the stress becomes too great, we enter distress and that's when it becomes debilitating. But this idea of being willing to push out of your comfort zone, try new things, and to recognize that there's as much reward in the failures as there are in the successes is super important. So those are the seven factors um, of resilience. And I think they're important. We all embody all of them to differing degrees. But once again, much like a muscle, the more that we deal with adversity, the better we become at each one of these seven factors. And so if you do use the report or take the resilience factor inventory and answer the online 60 questions, this is what a report looks like. There's the adaptive norm, which is based on you know, thousands of people that have been through the assessment. And then there's your profile. And your profile is based on the questions that answered and it's been validated and so forth. Um, you'll see that you get a score for each one of these and you can see the delta between how you're doing on each of the seven factors and how others are. And then you get a, a, a weighted average, which is the RQ score, right? Your resilience quotient. What's cool is that when I do this in workshops with intact teams, not only can we do a report for the individuals, but we actually can generate a team report, which is really back to if the organization is only as res resilient as the people leading it, wouldn't it be interesting to get a snapshot of just how resilient your organization or your team is? So if those of you that are on this are interested, um, I can get you pricing info and we can go through what it looks like to take the assessment. So a little bit more just around kind of where you're at and what we're dealing with, right, with the pandemic right now. Um, several years ago, I wrote an article, and this was after working for several large companies. And my frustration with the large companies that I work for, um, and having also worked with startups, was that the bigger the company, the more risk averse they were. And it just didn't make any sense to me. Bigger companies should actually be more risk tolerant because they can compartmentalize the risk. But it turns out that bigger companies tend to do everything they can to mitigate risks. And as a result, they lose their competitive edge. They lose their innovation. And you look at the companies that make the most innovative products tend to be startups, not the incumbents. 
And so when you think about you and being leaders of startups, your position in the market, you have a competitive advantage in the fact that you're small, smaller in size. I think about it this way, is the need for speed. When I think about all the startups that I work with, and when I say startups, it's companies that you know, are in kind of that growth stage. They may have anywhere between you know, five and even 2,000 people, but they're still you know, not bureaucratic enterprises. The biggest advantage that they bring versus the incumbents is speed. It's the ability to make a decision in the morning and implement it in the afternoon. Larger companies have these you know, bureaucratic processes where when somebody wants to implement something new, it has to get run up the flagpole. There have got to be all these different layers of approvals and so forth. And everybody along the way comes up with reasons why not to do it. And so many ideas are dead on arrival because of that. And so in a smaller company, you have agility and the ability to make decisions and move quickly. As we're dealing with the COVID-19 challenges, you have the ability to refocus and shift your businesses much more quickly than larger organizations do. You have to figure out ways to use speed to your advantage. So I mentioned that I'm a, a big fan of surfing, right? Um, so Sean Thompson was a world champion surfer from South Africa. And he wrote a book, uh, and the book is called The Code, and uh, available on Amazon. It's an awesome, really quick read. It's you know, these 12 chapters, 12 stories, and he writes out and believes that I will equals power. And in the book, he now goes around and he teaches this as a workshop, um, both for kids and for business leaders. And the idea is that if you vision and you create a path and something that you commit to doing for yourself, your likelihood of completing that goal or that task goes up by like 80% if you write it down. And so what he has done is he's created what he calls the code and it's these 12 things that he will do. I'll be myself, I'll dream, I'll face my fears, I'll never give up, I will create, I'll heal, I'll pray, I'll give, I'll make a difference, I'll imagine, I'll have faith, and I'll share stories. And so my challenge to each of you is to write out three statements that start with I will. And they may be things that you're going to do for yourself, things that you're going to do for your family, or things that you're going to do for your organization or your team. But writing them down is the first step in terms of committing to taking action. And then I want you to revisit that list and hold yourself accountable for whether or not you're going to do it or not. So I'm going to give you a minute and I'm going to ask you to write down three I will statements. Brian, while they are writing yeah. down their statements, I'm wondering, do you maybe have a quick link or maybe I should just share it? Maybe people can have this book also, because this is a book, right? Yeah, it's a book. Let me see if I can get it for those who's interested. Yeah, what's cool in the book is at the very end of the book, the last piece, actually, he's got um, a list of about, you know, 50 quotes from different kids that said what they will do. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really neat kind of, you know, way. And there's actually also on YouTube, um, he did about a month ago, um, he did a webcast um, that was really, you know, it told the story of the book um, and the power of I will. Um, and so you could watch a replay of that. It was, it was, it was pretty inspirational. Um, but from a resilient standpoint, I believe very strongly in this idea about, um, you know, this visioning and being able to, in your head, you know, set a path forward in terms of what you're going to commit yourself to. There you go. It's, and Serena okay. just posted to the chat a link to the book.
All right, I'm gonna move us forward. If you didn't finish that or your list of your superpowers and kryptonite, that's your uh, homework assignment. So I was reflecting with some people the other day about the fact that you know, we are starting to see things you know, open back up and people are leaving their homes and getting out a little bit more. And it led me to this question, which is, what might you regret not having done while you're under stay-at-home orders? Right? Is there a closet that you, you know, forever have said, I should clean that out, I should organize that, I should digitize that box of pictures that I've always wanted you know, to maintain or keep? You know? And so the question to you and something to reflect on is, is there something that you could do this weekend, a project at home, that will make you feel good and say, you know what, I used that time productively. I got something done and that you otherwise would regret as we potentially start returning to the fast paced life that we left behind um, that, you know, that you'd have a regret around. And so just a, a point of reflection back to, you know, how do we make the most of the situation that we're in? So I wrote a piece um, the other day, it's a blog post, um, and it's a model that I've used for years around change management. And it's really about this idea about embracing the new normal. So this is an image of, there's a ridiculous TV show in the US now called American Ninja Warriors. Um, you know, and it's kind of a competition thing. And so one of the um, acts is to do this high wire trapeze act, where you have to fly across, you know, um, the trapeze almost like Tarzan. But I believe that it's a really powerful visual for um, change management and what we're all going through. And it's this idea that in order to embrace the new, we have to release the old. And if we don't let go of the old and we try to embrace the new while still holding on to the past, we get torn in two different directions and we're destined to fall. And so you have to make this split second decision to know when you've got a good grip on the new and you can let go of the old. But you know, we have to be moving forward. And so it's important that we're, as change agents and leaders in organizations, modeling the behavior for the rest of our companies to say, hey, things are going to be different, but we have to embrace different and what the world is gonna look like going forward. And so there's a, a full blog post about this on, on my website. Um, but I think that this image is very helpful for people that are struggling with dealing with change. Last question for each of you, and this is something I use in my executive coaching quite a bit. Um, and it's a, a question that all leaders need to ask themselves. And it's this idea of would I thrive working for me? So if I were my own boss and I had to directly report to me, would I not just survive, but would I thrive? Would I be able to be my best employee working for me? And so part of this is a reflection. Look in the mirror and think about, am I the type of leader that I want, would want leading me or no? And if no, what are the things that you need to change? Are you a micromanager? Do you not pay enough attention to people? Do you multitask when, you're trying, when they're trying to have conversations? Do you tell or do you ask? Do you ask the right questions of people? Do you give people the latitude to make mistakes or to do things their way? And so I think as each of you continue to grow as leaders and grow your organization, it's really important to think about how you're positioning yourself as leaders. And so, you know, as we talk about resilience, um, there's leadership in crisis and there's leadership in normal times. But I believe that leading in crisis shows the true spirit of a leader. And so how you've been navigating um, these past months and how you're gonna navigate going forward will really be you know, a benchmark for how you're seen by others. And when we talk to Aman a little bit later, um, he'll talk about himself and about Chris, who's the CEO of Toast that they brought in in 2015. And Chris, over the course of this crisis, has really stepped up and been an amazing leader through crisis. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's awesome to see 
how people tend to either rise to the occasion or how they tend to kind of you know, fade um, during times like this. And so think about this question. So just in conclusion, a couple last things. I believe each of us has a groove, something that we do that's better, special, or different. Identifying that, tapping into it, represents the destination on your journey to self-awareness. Now, and you each chose to start or lead a company um, because you saw an opportunity in the market. You saw this ability within yourself to take an optimistic approach. You didn't ask for coronavirus, none of us did, um, but each of you are navigating through it, you know, and you're not in it alone, we're all in it together. And the more you can reach out and rely on each other and rely on others in your organization, you know, the better served you're gonna be coming out the other end. Um, but I think this is an important time to take stock and to reflect on yourself, to reflect on whether you're sticking your neck out like the turtle, whether you're operating with square wheels, when in fact you've got some round ones in the cart and it just takes some, you know, some rejiggering and some you know, adaption in order to be more successful going forward. So with that, um, I want you to think about this as a parting question.